Hey, well, welcome. This is this is the last lecture. Woo, woo, woo. Um, you know, it's been a, it's it's been a, a good couple of five weeks here. Um, I, I know we've covered a lot of material. Um, this is a lot. Uh, for a summer class. And, and again, as I said at the beginning, we sort of almost do like a week's worth of uh, lecture material every day uh, in this class. So so I know it was a lot, but um, it's, it's just about over except for a couple little things. Um, so we've got our last test. And again, you know, classes are over on Friday. I can't, I can't extend the test into the weekend. Um, I wish I could, but unfortunately not allowed. Um, everything has to be done on Friday. So the test then will be ready tomorrow, Thursday at 10 a.m. You can go in and take it. It'll be the usual 75 multiple choice questions. The only difference between this test and the, the previous two tests will be the questions, but the format and the timing, everything then is the same. You have 75 minutes to do it and you can uh, basically you know, basically be done by, by Friday, uh, one minute before midnight, then that's when the test will close. We also have then the last lab, which is again, remember where there's a lab then that we couldn't do. So this is the sort of makeup lab for that. Um, it's about craters on the earth and that'll make a little bit more sense maybe after, uh, after today's lecture. Um, but that will be ready to, actually it's ready right now, but, um, uh, technically it's supposed to start tonight at, uh, at 8 PM and, uh, I will be there uh, on Zoom from 8 to 10 tonight if you have any questions about that lab. Should be pretty straightforward. There's one thing I'm going to change in the lab though. There's a part where you're supposed to, you've got a big long list of all the known craters on the earth and you're supposed to pick 40 random craters from those the, that list then and sort of mark them down on a map. Uh, just in the interest of time I'm going to have you skip that step um, and just go right to looking then at a plot showing where all the craters on the earth uh, actually are. And we'll see that plot later in, uh, in today's sort of uh, uh, discussion. But so that's the plan then. Um, you've just got, uh, oh, oh, and then there's also then sort of a quiz homework then over the last couple of, of lectures. And that'll, that'll maybe help you study for the test a little bit. And if you look on the As You Learn site then, there is sort of a study guide or at least a list of topics. And there's also the equation sheet, although the only equations on this exam then will be the stuff that we, we didn't have time for on exam number two, the stuff that about the Doppler shift. So there'll probably be one or two Doppler shift questions on the exam. But right away, if you do the math and you go, well, you know, I, I don't want to do any equations, um, you know, and it's, it's talking about maybe two Doppler shift equations on the exam. So I don't do either of those. If I get everything else right, I get a 96. Um, maybe I'm not going to be up, up, up all night um, learning the Doppler equation. That choice is, of course, you, yours. It is important, and you will see it later on in astronomy, too. Again, because this is one of the ways we figure out that how things are moving out there in space by looking at their Doppler shift. So, again, uh, enough about that. Should make sense. Oh, I, I will make one other point, though. Test number three just covers the stuff since test number two. So Doppler shifts and, and all of the stuff we've been talking about in the solar system. It's not a comprehensive exam. Unfortunately, also during the summer, we don't have a lot of time. And I, I don't think it would be, you know, I don't think it's fair to, to give you a comprehensive last exam that covers all the material um, throughout the entire course, because you really just don't have time to study for that during the summer. So I don't know if other classes do it or not, but the, the, fi the, the last exam, exam number three, is not a final. It's just over the material since the, since the last exam. Although bits of it then do build on other bits, and you know, like all topics, all subjects. Anyways, all right, enough rambling. Um, uh, before I get going, though, for the people watching from home, any questions about the stuff we've been talking about? All right, good, good. Okay, so so no questions. Um, all right, so so let's uh, let's get this done. Um, the last thing to talk about. Okay, so up until now, the last couple topics have been like comets and asteroids, and this idea then of some of the little bits of you might even call them debris then um, in our solar system left over from the process of of planet formation. And, and we even towards the end of the comet talk. 
um, uh, m mentioned this idea of, of comets coming through the inner part of the solar system being heated up by the sun. You've got the ice then basically being vaporized. Oh, wait a minute, the comet nuclei then, that's a mixture of not only ice, but also dust. And some of that dust then also being you know, ejected by the nucleus into the coma then during this process of evaporation or more technically sublimation, the, the sort of light from the sun, the radiation from the sun, pushing some of that dust then out of the coma then, and basically then the, the, the comet's leaving behind this big old dust tail. And those individual dust particles that are in the tail then all end up basically in orbit around the sun. And, and, and the idea of the Earth passing through this sort of dust, dust trail left behind by the comets and seeing meteor showers. And, and so, yeah, there are times when you can go out during the year at night and, and there's a particularly large number of meteors that all look like they're coming from some point and we go, oh, it's the Perseid meteor shower. Um, and, and yeah, okay, good, good, yeah, yay. Um, but also though, even any, on any given night, you can go out and look up. And if you just look up for you know, maybe five, 10 minutes, depending on how dark the sky is, you'll see you know, a, a little streak of light then. You'll see a shooting star. That's sort of the, the colloquial, colloquial name for these things, uh, shooting stars, meteors. And so these are bright streaks of light then, typically bright streaks of light that move across the sky very, very quickly. They only last a few seconds. You've all seen them, these shooting stars. This is different from comets. Remember, comets hang there over a period of weeks and months and change their positions very, very slowly. Meteors all just, just sort of shoot across the sky then. The particles that are creating these, these streaks of light are basically little tiny, tiny bits of debris then that are they're basically uh, falling into the Earth's atmosphere. Either they're, they're just sitting out there and the Earth plows into them and they're on their own orbit and they intersect with the Earth. But at any rate, they end up falling into the Earth. And the particles that we're talking about are typically basically little dust size. You talk about sizes then on the small end then um, from uh, microscopic dust then. I mean, you, a, a typical shooting star then is maybe about the size of a grain of sand. Some are smaller and a few are bigger. Um, on the larger side, you can start talking about, you know, maybe a hundred meters across and that's going to be a thing. It's basically something the size of a football field. Those are rare. For the most part though, what you're seeing then are basically little bits of dust that, um, about the size of a grain of sand. And they, they enter our atmosphere, they're moving very, very quickly, they heat, and boom, you get the light. This is happening about 50, 75 miles up um, in our atmosphere, where it starts to get so thick as, the, as they're falling then, that the, basically the force of the air rushing past them, the friction from that actually heats them up, and boom, the next thing you know, you got this little, little streak of light then. And, and if you think about the sizes though, they tend to be very small, maybe about two, I want to say uh, sort of uh, two per day then um, are actually sort of big enough though to make it through the atmosphere and end up then landing on the ground. Some of them then um, producing, we'll see later, actual visible impact strikes. Um, and, and if you think about it then, uh, you know, they're, they're traveling very fast, to, uh, 10 to 30 kilometers per second, or about 30 times in the speed of a rifle bullet. And so this is crazy though, when you go outside then and you see these shooting stars, these meteors, you're, for the most part, seeing them, these little bits of dust entering our atmosphere, moving 30 times the speed of a rifle bullet. The, the friction from all that air causes them to burn up, for the most part, except for maybe a couple of days, for the most part, then, to burn up in our atmosphere. And I know that surprises a lot of people who are like, uh, wow, you know, I'm really seeing something just, you know, like the size of it. Let's see if I can turn that down any. That's a little bit better. Yeah, you mean really, I'm seeing something really just the size of a grain of sand burning up in our atmosphere. But let me see if we play that again. There we go. But yeah, that, that's sort of the basic idea. And, and you can look at what's happening now. Um, you've got this very, very small particle then. It's flying through our atmosphere. You basically got the friction of the, the air molecules then hitting it. And friction then releases heat. Just take your hands and rub them together like that. Your hands are going to start to warm up because of the friction. And this ends up then superheating uh, the particle then and actually vaporizing the material. And that heated air then is basically causing the glow. It's a, it's a hot glowing gas then um, left behind. And yeah, so here we go. Here's sort of the yeah, upper atmosphere then you're talking about about 100 kilometers up or about 60, 60 miles up then um, for, for these... Uh, for these shooting stars then, uh, to occur. Um, and okay, this is where, this is where it gets 
I don't know. This has always annoyed me. I'm just going to come out and say it then. The terminologies here are, are confusing um, because we can talk about then the object before it enters the Earth's atmosphere, the little particle, a little grain of sand, something like that, a little particle of dust. Then um, we talk about it as a meteoroid before it hits our atmosphere. So when it's floating out there in space, it's a meteoroid. It's on its way then to becoming a meteor, which is actually when it's burning up in the atmosphere, the, the sort of you know, event that you're seeing there, the streak of light in the sky. We go, oh, look, it's a meteor caused by a meteor meteoroid. And if it makes it to the ground, though, if, if it's actually big enough to survive the passage through the Earth's atmosphere and you find it sitting there on the ground, that then becomes a meteorite. So when it's in space, it's a meteoroid. When it's going through our atmosphere, lighting up, then it's a meteor. And when it hits the ground, then it's a meteorite. And you go, oh, man, all right, these are the people who brought me magnitudes. Why am I not surprised? But again, these are historical terms. Uh, but but that, those are the terms and. Um, that we want to use. And, and yeah, wait a minute, meteorite, some of these particles then are actually large enough um, to survive passage through the Earth's atmosphere. And then you're, so you're starting to talk about you know, sizes of things that are up in the, the, the centimeters, inches, or, or meters, feet, you know, sort, sort of larger objects that, that, that can survive this passage through the atmosphere. And those, of course, are the meteorites. And there are three different types of meteorites. And in some sense, yeah, no, no, no. so there are three different types of meteorites. I'll, they'll make more sense. Maybe I'll talk about them first, and then we'll see if they make sense. Um, stony meteorites. 93% of the meteorites that fall on the Earth from space are, are these stony meteorites. 93% of, these, these stony me of the meteorites and that land on the Earth are stony meteorites. And what that means, though, is they're, they're made of this sort of silicate, rocky type stony material, and they, they, they basically look like earth rocks. And so that's actually, eh, now I'll, I'll get back to this in a second. I'm just trying to, to, to decide the best order to bring this up in. But yeah, okay. So 93% of the meteorites then that strike the earth are these stony, silicate type rocky meteorites then. Six percent of the meteorites then um, that end up striking the earth then are iron meteorites. And these then, you look at them then, they're basically chunks of iron and nickel then um, that, that have survived the passage through the atmosphere. And you, and you go and you go, oh look, they're on the ground. You know, it's this big chunk of iron and nickel and, and it's very, very different from the earth rocks. If you sit there though and watch what actually strikes the earth, 93% of the, these, these meteors then that are passing through our atmosphere, striking the Earth, making it through, landing as rocks, then 93% of those meteorites then are the stony type. And then 6% of those are the iron types. So that's, that, that's actually what's falling to the Earth. Um, and there's 1% there's then that's sort of a mixture between the two. These are the stony iron meteorites, at least a name that makes sense. So there's sort of a mixture then of stone and iron, the sort of silicate type rock. So, so stone and iron, yeah, that makes sense. Um, what, what is weird, though, um, is if you look at the meteorites then that we find on the ground. Oh, I'm a meteorite hunter. I want to go find meteorites. And that can be an extremely lucrative uh, sort of prospect then because meteorites then are very valuable and collectors will pay pretty good prices um, for meteorites. And you go, all right, well, I'm going to go find myself some meteorites. I'm going to go start looking on the ground and try and find meteorites. What type of meteorite then do you think people find tend to find when they're looking on the ground for meteorites? Not not having watched one fall to the earth and go, oh, it landed over there, and, and yeah, there's a big you know hot rock landing there and sitting there on the ground. You go, ooh, it fell from space. Just walk around in your backyard trying to find meteorites. What what kinds do you think you sort of are you going to find? And 66% of the meteorites found on Earth are these iron meteorites. They only make up 6% of the meteorites striking the Earth, but they make up two-thirds of the meteorites actually found on Earth, these iron meteorites. So what's up with that? You know, it has to do with their composition and what they look like and their properties. If you're walking around out in your backyard and you find a stony meteorite, well, are you even going to notice it? Maybe it's just sitting right there and you walk right past it because it's a stony meteorite. It looks like all the other rocks in your garden. And you're like, ah, it's another darn rock. 
not even realizing maybe that it actually came from space. But if you're walking in your garden then and you see this chunk of iron and nickel sitting there laying in your garden, you go, okay, that's weird. Why, why, what's this doing in my garden? You pick it up then, and, you know, this is iron, nickel, this is metal, this is very, very dense. And you pick it up and it's really, really heavy for a rock and you go, this is really weird. Well, gosh, I know some meteorites are made out of iron and nickel. I wonder if this is a meteorite. So this is a selection effect. When you go out and actually you know, look on the ground for the meteorites, you tend to notice the iron meteorites and you tend to notice the stony iron meteorites because they're very, very different from earth rocks. The stony meteorites, though, they're just like the earth rocks. You tend not to notice them. You tend to walk right past them. And so if you look on the ground and you're trying to find meteorites, you tend to find the iron and stony iron meteorites that Oh, even though they make up only a small fraction of the meteor meteorites that actually striking the Earth. And so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, all right, a little bit about their properties then. The stony meteorites then actually break down into two types. There, there's a type then sort of on the top here then. These are known as chondrites then. They're sort of dark gray. Uh, if you look at them then, they've got sort of a little grainy appearance, almost sort of like a marble, something like that. If you look at them closely then, they've got small little um, spherical grains. Those are referred to then as con chondrules. And if you look at them then, you know, those little chondrules then, you can actually find them containing uh, basically a, a little bit of water, some volatiles, very, very easy volatiles. That's a fancy term for, for um, elements, things that are very, very easy to evaporate, um, like, like calcites and things like that. Um, and you also then find some organic compounds then, also in some of these. On the opposite side then, you've, also, you've got the achondrites. And, and often when you put a in front of a word then, it means not. And so these then are uh, I don't want to say S-type meteorites, stony meteorites, in, but they don't have these chondrules in. And you can sort of compare it then. This looks almost like a piece of marble here. You can see all these little chondrules in here. You look at an achondrite here like that, and it's a much, much, much sort of smoother, um, featureless sort of rock then. Uh, and, and the idea behind them is that these have been subject to some heating. It's some sort of stony type uh, asteroid, some, sorry, I don't want to say asteroid yet, but some sort of stony type material, though, but, it, but it's actually been heated then. It's, it's been subject to an intense heat, and they almost more sort of resemble some of them than even what you might find out in Hawaii then, like a basaltic type rock. And so, um, yeah, we've got then, so basically the, these two types of stony meteorites. There is a, a, a sort of subset of the, the chondrites then um, that I want to talk about then. These are the carbonaceous chondrites. And so these are the chondrites and they contain, that really contain the volatiles and the organic compounds. And so these are the ones, you know, again, we've been talking about this idea of these organic molecules that you find out, you know, in the cheap seats of the solar system where it was, you know, it was cold enough then for these ices to form. And you've got this methane and these other carbon bearing molecules that are constantly getting rearranged by photochemistry then from the ultraviolet light from the sun. And here we go. You've got these, these carbonaceous chondrites that, that contain these organic molecules. And, and again, um, they're not, if they get, if you take one of these in and you heat it up and you melt it, you're going to destroy those molecules. I mean, the heat's going to be too high. The molecules then are going to get dissociated, and, and you won't have you won't have this this chondrules sorry chondrite structure. You won't have the chondrules and the organic molecules that have been will have been destroyed in the heating process. And so the idea behind these these carbonaceous chondrites then is these are some of the oldest sort of materials, the oldest objects then in the solar system, and they contain the unaltered remains then of the protoplanetary disk. These, the, these, this material then hasn't been sub subject to heat. This is the stuff then um, out there in the solar system from which the planets formed. And, and that's not why people are so um, absolutely interested in these objects. And what's really crazy is some of them have even been found to have some very complex uh, organic molecules. And one of the ideas that you sometimes hear people talk about is this idea you know, some of the organic molecules that we find here on the Earth may have been deposited um, by these objects and landing uh, here on the Earth. It's a, it's a wacky, wild theory. But this idea then that organic molecules are not uncommon 
um, in our solar system. And of course, you know, looking at life here on Earth, it's nothing but organic chemistry, organic molecules inter interacting. And if it's common in this solar system, what about other solar systems? Anyway, stuff to keep you up at night then. Um, we've got the carbonaceous chondrites then, and those are about 6% of the stony type um, meteorites. We've also then got the iron meteorites then. And again, looking at an iron meteorite, you know, if you cut it in half, this is nothing like anything you know, you're going to find in your garden that's the result of a process, really a, a geological process here on Earth. And you find this, this wacky sort of crystal pattern in here. And this is a Wittmannstraten. I can never say that word. It's this word then. Uh, Patton, you can tell. Um, I don't actually say that word a lot. A uh, Wittmannstraten uh, pattern. Then. But the whole idea then is you get this crystal when you take iron and you cool it then very, 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 very slowly then. And, and um, gosh, um, oh, well, what's going on with that then? Um, well, you've got a very slow cooling process. You tend to not find that here on the Earth. Things tend to cool off uh, very, very rapidly. But, um, gosh, what does that mean? And, and you think about then, um, where could that have come from? And, and the idea, okay, we're seeing then, it's actually sort of iron, nickel, we're seeing, where we've seen that before. Oh, this idea then of like the, I'm going to get cut to the chase here. You can go back to what we talked about with the asteroid classes and talking about then the S-type asteroids, the C-type asteroids, and the M-type asteroids. And thinking then about these, these meteorites then that have landed here on the surface as, as maybe having an origin then in the same material that those asteroids then are also made out of. Or thinking about Vesta then in this process where I've got a reasonably large asteroid proto planetary chunk that's sort of forming together and enough heat is being released for it to differentiate. It differentiates then and then something happens to break it up. And in that process then you're going to have uh, basically the, the broken up mantle material that'll basically be rocky because this is coming from the differenti uh, differentiated body. And you'll also then have the core material that, that's differentiated then. It, so it, it came together, it heated up in the, the formation process like Vesta, it differentiated all the, the sort of metals and dense stuff sunk to the surface, and then it got broken apart or bits got broken off it then. And so the, the chunks from the core then are basically going to end up being these iron meteorites. And you think about, well, all right, okay, so, so I've got this differentiation process that happens. I've got this, this sort of uh, the slow cooling process and thinking about then in order to see something like this, in order to see this crystal pattern in the iron and think about how big does an object have to be to cool off that slowly. And you're talking about cooling off then over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. You're talking about you have to have an object at least 30 kilometers in diameter. Because remember, the bigger something is, the longer it takes to cool off. Again, going back to the, the baked potatoes or comparing then Earth and Mars and, and how long, you know, the, the less mass you have, the smaller it is, the, the, the quicker it cools off. And so saying this had to have come from a body originally at least 30 kilometers across in order to cool off slowly enough to get this crystal pattern then um, in the iron. And again, though, if you're walking in your garden, this really stands out. Um, because you go, oh, look, it's iron. And, and that's maybe my, one of my favorite meteor, meteorite stories is, you know, as an astronomer, you get a lot of people coming into the office going, oh, I found this on the ground. Is this a meteorite? And um, this actually was when I was in Wisconsin and, and somebody coming to the office. And, and this happened like maybe about once every couple of years. Usually it was a piece of slag from a, uh, a foundry or something you, you had back then a lot of sort of blacksmith shops, blacksmith shops and things like that. And they'd, they'd have sort of molten metal that would end up then being kicked into the woods and stuff. And then somebody finds it and brings it in. And you go, no, no, that's just a piece of, piece of scrap iron then from probably some blacksmith a couple hundred years or a hundred years ago or something like that. Anyways, a uh, person comes in though with, a, with a, um, uh, what they think then is an iron meteorite that they found near the lake. Um, and, and, but it's, it's a perfectly spherical ball and, and yeah, it's iron. And, and, and they were really surprised to find, um, that it was a cannonball. Ah, 
and and they thought it was a meteorite because it was made out of this iron. And uh, no, no, that was actually a cannonball. They were frequently used by, as ballast and on uh, Great Lake ships. Anyway, more than you need to know. Whole thing behind it though is these things jump out at you. That's why these tend to be found more than S-type silicate-type uh, uh, meteorites or stony-type meteorites. Um, the the sort of between the two, you can also then find sort of stony iron meteorites, again, of the, the ones that are falling to the earth. This only makes up about 1% of the meteorites making their way to earth. But this is, this is sort of wonderful then because you can actually see then a, a sort of mixture then of these little bits of metal then surrounded then uh, by this rocky type material. And the idea then is these, these bits probably came from a larger body that had formed underwent the differentiation process. And these chunks actually came from right at the border between the iron core and sort of the silicate, uh, silicate, uh, we don't want to say mantle then uh, of one of these, uh, one of these asteroids. Or um, the other possibility then is this is just an undifferentiated body, but, but probably, yeah, probably sort of something that came from the, the, the border between the core and the mantle then of one of these asteroids. Um, so sort of seeing them all together, this is what we've been talking about then. You've got an ordinary chondrite here where you can see the condrules here. This is a carbonaceous chondrite. chondrite. Notice it's darker. It's a, it's a darker gray here then than what you'd find with an ordinary chondrite. But again, if you were to walk by this, pass this in the yard, you might not even notice it, especially if I scorched the outside then from the heat and you, uh, it's a rock. Um, you've got the irons, and then you've got the stony irons, and this is an achondrite, uh, achondrite meteorite right there. Okay, well, so, all right, maybe even the yard, backyard, maybe the garden is not the best place to look for, uh, look for meteorites. What would be a good place? And it turns out really the best place on the planet to go look for meteorites in, uh, would be Antarctica. Well, and that actually kind of makes sense then. Um, over half of the 40,000 meteorites that we found here on the Earth, over half of them then have come from Antarctica. And if you think about that, um, that makes sense. Uh, Antarctica then, it's basically a, a giant ice sheet, and any Earth rocks then are actually buried underneath the ice. And so if you're walking along and you find a rock on top of the ice, um, odds are it came from above and not below. And so just walking around there and seeing then, you know, oh, look, it's a rock in the middle of this, this ice sheet. Oh, uh, it's probably then a, a, a meteorite. Um, a, a, but, but if you think about what actually happens then uh, after, and here they are, this is actually, you know, oh, look, it's a meteorite here on top of this ice sheet. Um, uh, what happens though is it does relatively quickly get covered up then by snow and ice. But the, the ice then, these ice sheets then actually move. And what, what often happens then is that the, the meteorites then fall, they land on the ice sheet then, they get covered up, and so they're, they're basically trapped in this ice sheet then. The ice sheet though often moves and, and basically flows up against a, some sort of a mountain, something like that, and gets pushed up against it then. You've got the wind though basically eroding the top of the ice sheet uh, up along this mountain here, and basically the fancy word for this is ablating the ice, or basically just blowing away, eroding the ice, and uncovering then the meteorites then that, that were trapped in this ice sheet. So they end up falling, you know, all over, all over Antarctica. They get pushed up against these mountains then. The winds basically blow the ice then off, off the tops of them then, and, and there they are. You just walk along and look. Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a, a meteorite right there on the on the ground. And um, the one that, I've sh that I'm showing you there is actually ALH84001, which is kind of weird. How, why, did, why does somebody walk around that, uh, with that with that in their head? But this is a very, very famous meteorite in that it uh, turns out to, to at least chemically um, very much uh, represent um, or, or resemble that uh, rocks from Mars. And so this is one, an example then of a small, small subset of meteorites then that do, to, do appear then to actually have come from Mars. There's some giant impact on Mars. You get, you know, this debris thrown up. If it's, an, uh, if it's a big enough impact then, if a large enough object then is hitting Mars, some of the thing can be kicked up and uh, out of the atmosphere and actually kicked up with a speed fast enough then faster than Mars's escape velocity, which is only about five kilometers per second, uh, and, and boom, off they go then out into space, and some of them, some of them then 
end up landing here on Earth. And we saw the same thing, I mentioned the same thing with, with the moon, where a very small subset of the meteorites known on Earth that very much resemble moon rocks. And again, the idea of some impact on the moon kicking debris up, some of that debris then getting, getting kicked off the moon and ended up landing here on Earth. And what's fascinating, though, about the, this, uh, this meteorite, then, is if you cut it open and you look at it uh, very, very closely, there's definite, again, evidence then of, of bits of it having maybe been exposed to liquid water. And, and this is still a subject of great debate, um, whether or not you can actually see fossilized bacteria um, in, that, in, that, uh, in that meteorite. And at the time when it was first found, everybody was like, oh, look, fossilized bacteria. It does turn out, though, that geological processes then can actually produce structures that closely resemble then what, what they're seeing and thinking about it as bacteria. But nonetheless, it's absolutely fascinating that, that we already do have pieces of Mars then um, here on the Earth. Wow. Um, do you think we have pieces of Venus here on the Earth? And, well, how are, how are Mars and Venus different from each other? And thinking about, okay, one, Venus has a lot more mass. Venus has a, a lot more gravity at its surface. It's much, much more similar to the Earth. Um, and its escape velocity is much, much, much faster or higher than the escape velocity of Mars. Venus's gravity is stronger. So you have to get objects moving just off the top of my head about twice as fast. Um, to leave the, leave the surface of Venus as you do Mars. And Venus then also has this other problem where it, you've got this tremendous thick atmosphere. So any impact on Venus then, the bits flying off that, that impact then, have to be moving fast enough to, to basically escape the gravitational field of, of Venus, but they also have to be moving fast enough to get out of its atmosphere. And it's got that thick, heavy atmosphere. And the idea behind that then is, is probably not. We would be very, very surprised if there was a piece of Venus here on the Earth, just because of the tremendous speeds you'd have to have the, the material going to escape Venus. That, and, and do you think it'd be really easy to tell whether or not you had a piece of Venus's uh, crust here on the Earth as opposed to the Earth's. And again, this idea that, that they're probably fairly similar if you look at the structures of the planets. And yeah, so anyways, all right. Uh, sorry, there's a bit of a ramble there. Um, but yeah, so, so if you want to really go find meteorites, then best place to do it is Antarctica. But they do land elsewhere, um, elsewhere, uh, elsewhere here on the Earth. And, and there are times then that, that you actually can see them landing. And if it's a particularly bright um, if it's a particularly bright meteor um, and a lot of atmosphere then passing by, you, you, we talk about them then as bolides. Or if it's super, super bright, then this idea of a super bolide. And, and a bolide then super, super bright, and often then they end up exploding then in the Earth's atmosphere. So much heat is generated. You've got this piece of rock then uh, trapped in the rock are little pockets of gas. You superheat that, that rock. The gas expands, and often then it's enough um, to explode, uh, explode the, the body then that's having, traveling towards you. But you see this. Let me see if I can play this movie. Come on. Oh, yeah, it's the next slide then. Um, uh, so, but then, yeah, okay. And so super bolides then. These huge, bright meteors then often end up exploding then in the Earth's atmosphere. This is a Great example of one from 2013, um, as seen in Russia. So here they are on their way to uh, work February 15th, 2013. At the local time, it's about 9.20 in the morning. Just stopped at the, the traffic light. Do, 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 do. Nothing going on. Just, oh, wait. And so there you go. And it basically then ended up exploding, and uh, for the most part, a lot of the debris then um, ended up uh, ended up just burning up in the atmosphere then after after it exploded. Then, um, all right. So this was this was an asteroid then, or I should say a meteoroid. It was about 59 feet in, uh, across. Then it weighed about 11,000 tons. Then it hit the atmosphere then, going at about 41,600 uh, miles per hour. And it heated enough, it exploded about 18 miles then um, above the Earth's surface. And it released about 30 times the energy of an atomic bomb then when this thing exploded. But, but the nice thing then, you know, it exploded 18 miles above uh, the, the surface of the Earth. 
But there was still then a, a tremendous shock wave that, that came off this from that explosion that, that ended up ended up breaking a lot of a, a lot of windows. And actually, about fifteen hundred people were injured. Nobody was killed, but about fifteen hundred people were injured on the ground when this thing exploded. And what often happens with this then is I don't want to use the word problem, but it's it's an effect that if you think about that, the, the speed of sound is much, 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 much slower than the speed of light. And when something like this explodes, then the shock wave, well, that's just air pushing against air. That shock wave then basically you know, travels out away then at the speed of sound. And what often happens then is you get you know the flash of light and that's that's moving at the speed of light. So the flash of light is almost instantaneous. And what happens then is, is you're sitting there having your morning cup of coffee. There's this big flash of light outside. What do you do? Oh, I'm going to go to the window and look out the window and try and figure out then uh, what just created this big flash of light. And, and you're sitting there at the window. And then a minute or two later, the shockwave hits and just shatters your window that you happen to have your face up against when that shock wave hits. So, so that, that actually causes a, a surprising number of in, uh, injuries and uh, just due to the delay between the speed of light um, and the, the, the speed of sound. Uh, but again, this, is, this, this has happened before. Um, I want to say it happens all the time, at least in the history of the Earth, and, uh, and even, even sort of over the span of human lifetime, uh, people's lifetime. I mean, this is 1908. Um, this is Tunguska, Siberia. And in 1908, there was a tremendous explosion over Siberia, 1908. Um, uh, the trouble is, it was Siberia in 1908. Really, nobody if, if essentially lived there, a couple little tiny villages. The, the site then wasn't really explored. Nobody investigated this until about 20 years later. And, and so this is 20 years then after the impact, or the, well, I don't want to use the word impact, but, but after the event. Um, uh, 20 years later, they, they came and, and photographed some of what they saw, and basically it was about 80 million trees had been knocked over, over an area then of about 830 uh, square miles of forest, just completely flattened then. 80 million trees then all sort of pushed over, and, and if you look then, they're all sort of pushed all in the same direction. Uh, radiating then uh, out away from a point then sort of in the center. And what was what initially confused people, I mean, your, your sort of first idea behind this is, yeah, we've had some sort of meteor impact, something like that. Something has hit the earth then and created this shockwave that pushed all of these trees down. Um, but nobody could find a meteor crater. Nobody could find an impact site then um, that caused this. And again, the idea behind this, and it was some, it was a lot like a, a, a super bolide then, where you had um, basically something coming in through the atmosphere, a large meteor, maybe even some people even think it was part of a comet, something like that then, um, that exploded, but it, it exploded before it hit the ground. It was sort of like an air detonation, and the shock wave then around it basically flattened the trees as this shock wave then spread out. And looking at what they, they saw, and you can just do the math, what's it going to take to, to knock down this many trees over this large of an area then? And it was about, about a thousand atomic bombs worth of energy then, um, basically being released when this object exploded in our atmosphere. And, and so, you know, this is 1908. This is like a little bit more than 100 years ago, uh, something like this. Imagine what would have happened if... It was just, you know, I don't know, about 12 hours later, and the Earth had undergone half a rotation. And, and thinking about then, you know, this actually happening over maybe a more populated area um, of the Earth. And, and oh, goodness. Um, and, and starting to think and worry about this then um, a little bit. And there are other examples, though, of, of these objects, these, these meteoroids um, on the larger size then uh, making their way through the Earth's atmosphere. My favorite example then um, uh, this is the Peekskill meteorite, and it happened then in uh, 19, oh, when, when was it? 19, oh, all right, I got a peak then. Uh, ah, 1992 then, October 9th, 1992. Uh, on the, this was visible on the east coast of the United States, and the nice thing was it happened on a, a Friday, early Friday evening then. Um, and what that meant then, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, sort of high school football games going on, and a lot of people, you know, 
taken videos of the high school football game. So there were several dozen um, uh, sort of home movies and of the, the meteorite then actually passing uh, through our atmosphere um, on its way down. So it was witnessed then by tens of thousands of people then um, on the East Coast. And when it hit the Earth then, it weighed about 26 pounds and it was about one foot in diameter then. So it's basically a, a big loaf of bread then. Um, so, so here it is right there. Um, it struck the ground. And what, what it struck the ground though, um, didn't quite strike the ground. It actually struck a, a 1980 um, red Chevy Malibu. Um, right in the, you can see the damage then caused to the right rear of the car um, by the, this meteorite then actually striking the car. And um, this is Michelle Knapp. She was 17 years old at the time. She had just bought the car for like 300 bucks and, and it got hit by a meteorite. Um, you probably don't know this because it doesn't happen that much, but meteorite damage is usually not covered by insurance. Um, it's considered more sort of an act of God. Um, and so she, she was like really upset. She was like, oh, my, my car's just been hit. It turned out though that, that she um, basically took the, you know, it hit the meteorite, hit the car. She found it underneath the car. She took the meteorite, brought it into her house, ended up selling the meteorite then uh, for $50,000. And actually sold the car then, the car that had been hit by a meteorite, then sold it to a collector for another $25,000. So she ended up making about $75,000 out of the dealer. That's about $140,000 uh, in today's money. Um, so don't feel, don't feel too bad for it. But just go, it goes to show you then the value of these meteorites then. I mean, these are, these are rare objects from space and, and they're valuable both from a scientific standpoint and they're valuable to collectors. And so, yeah, it's okay. So yeah, you had a meteorite then, it, it hit her car. There it is on its, its way, uh, way through the Earth's atmosphere. Other examples so where you can find larger objects then that have passed through the Earth's atmosphere and, and some of them actually not exploding in the air, doing the, the Super Bowl like thing, but actually making it to the ground and striking the ground. The larger objects though, of course, ending up uh, leaving behind a crater. And this is the aptly named uh, Meteor Crater. Um, that's the name of it then. Um, and you can go out to Arizona then and actually see this. Um, and it's about one mile across, 550 feet deep then. It's the equivalent of about, if someone had, had blown up about 20 million uh, tons of TNT then, right there at the center. This happened then about 50,000 years ago. And it was an object then about 50 meters across, or maybe about half the size of a football field then, um, that hit the Earth then at about 28,000, maybe about 29,000 uh, miles per hour. And then it just left behind this huge crater. And if you think about this then, you think about the energy of motion tied up in an object, the kinetic energy, well, that's just the product of its mass and its velocity squared. So if I double the mass, a moving object then has twice the energy of motion. If I triple the mass, it has three times the energy of motion. But also if I think about the speed, it depends on the energy of motion then, the energy tied up in that object moving, its kinetic energy scales as the speed squared. So if it's moving two times faster, four times more energy. If it's moving 10 times faster, a hundred times more energy. And so here we have something then um, that is about you know 100 or 150 feet across this chunk of rock then moving at, at almost 29,000 miles per hour. There's a tremendous amount of energy tied up in this, and boom, it strikes the surface, and the impactor then just like, sort of like what we talked about with the moon. The impactor then ends up getting vaporized. You get basically something solid. The the meteorite itself, or sorry, I should say the meteor itself. Um, no, I'm going to say the asteroid, the chunk of the asteroid itself, because that's, that's what we're talking about. That's where these things are coming from then. Uh, basically going from a solid to a gas, taking up much, much more volume, that expanding gas, and basically excavating this crater. And so there we go. Um, uh, you know, the, the larger objects then tend to leave behind these craters. This is actually owned by someone. Um, this isn't a state park or anything like that. You got to stop at the gate and you can pay them. You know, there's the parking lot. Stop at the gate then, pay them a little money, and you can go actually down then um, inside the, this crater. But if you look on the surface of the earth, then you can find other spots, other evidence of other impacts that have taken place on the earth uh, over time. And so here's another, this is uh, Quebec, and this crater is a sort of a multi-ring structure then. It's about 100 kilometers in diameter, or about 60 miles across then. And, and uh, it's actually filled with water here along the edge then. So you've got this, this, this reservoir here. 
Um, and, and sort of, you know, the, the reservoir was sort of an inner ring here. Um, gosh, this is about 214 million years old then. And it was caused then by an impactor. And again, remember the size of this set. We're, we're talking about, you know, 60 miles across. If you go by just the edge of the lake, then it's actually about 70 miles across then. Um, uh, you know, so this is a huge crater. We're talking about something hitting the Earth then about three miles across or about five kilometers across in an object then basically about the size of Boone, um, uh, maybe actually even bigger than Boone, um, striking, striking the Earth about 200 million years ago then creating this crater. Um, a, a real classic example of a crater then, this is Wolf, uh, Wolf Creek Crater um, in Australia. This is about, uh, I think it's in Australia. It's about uh, 300,000 years old then. It's about a half mile across. And again, you know, these craters um, here on the Earth, uh, looking at Hudson Bay, um, gosh, um, it almost looks... If I, if I look, then I almost can sort of see a nice circle right here with a, a, a sort of mound at the center. Remember talking about the, the lunar craters, this idea you have an impact like that. The, the vaporizing impactor then um, clears out the, the sort of crater and you get the basically you know, a collision like this. You get a shock wave that propagates down into the ground. It bounces off the ground and, or bounces, goes down, bounces back. And basically, you know, you push against the ground, it, it gets pushed in, and then it bounces back, and it creates that central mound. You see this all over the moon then, and it's larger craters. And this idea that you've got this little sort of central mound on this crater too, almost like this was the result then um, of, of a giant impact. And, and so you go and you look on the surface of the Earth, and this is a, uh, I hope you can see it, um, this is a, a plot then that you'll see in the craters of the, on, the, on the Earth lab, and you look then at where the, the known craters are on the Earth. And there are about 160 known craters on the Earth. And if you look at where they are, you notice some stuff, though, um, like where the craters are and where the craters aren't. Like right off the bat, you know that notice there are really no craters um, really in the oceans. What's up with that? Well, would you expect something impacting the ocean to leave behind a crater? And the idea behind that is probably no. Um, that and the, the, the crust underneath the, the ocean then is, is very, very active. Um, so, so no, you, but basically no. If something's going to impact the ocean, then it's not going to leave behind a crust. Well, what about Antarctica then? I don't see any craters in Antarctica. And you go, well, wait a minute, though. And those, are, those are pretty much buried in ice. So, so those are going to be, the ice is pr pretty much going to glaciate those and, and get rid of them. That and they're buried. We can't see them. Um, I don't see any craters up here in like Alaska very much, or I don't see any um, down much sort of down here along the Andes, and I don't see many um, in through here along the Himalayas. What's up with that? You go, well, wait a minute then, those are, those are regions of very, very active geological activity here on the Earth. Any craters then that are, that are basically going to form in these, these mountainous areas, then they're, they're that's incredibly dynamic right there. They're not going to last very long. Well, I mean, there, there are a couple of craters and maybe sort of in through here in the Andes, in the, in the sort of jungles, and you go, yeah, those aren't going to last very long either. And those are going to be especially very, very difficult to find. There are a few up in here through Siberia. Eh, nobody really lives there. Those probably are, are you're not going to find those. Uh, uh, there's all sorts of things going on here that, that you need to think about then. Um, I don't see many craters in the Sahara. Oh, well, no, they're not going to last very long in the Sahara. And so, so just round about what's going on here then is remember the Earth's crust is very, very dynamic. We've got geological processes then that are creating and destroying the Earth's crust. And over time, then, craters left behind on the Earth's surface then, remember our surface is very, very young, those craters are going to get destroyed then through geological processes. And so in regions of the Earth's surface that are very geologically active, we're not going to expect to find a lot of craters. Likewise, then, we're probably not going to expect to run into a lot of craters in areas that are not very, how do we want to say, um, very heavily populated. Because you've got to, you know, oh, gosh, you know, is this a crater? I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody sort of lives there. Uh, you've got that. You've got other processes like the Sahara Desert and the jungles, and you've got these erosion processes that, that are also destroying the craters. So it's, it's this idea that the Earth's surface is very, very young, 
It's constantly evolving geologically. We've got all of these erosion processes that, that cover up or, and or destroy craters of geologically very, very quickly. And also this idea that, that maybe, you know, if nobody lives there, um, maybe you're not going to notice a crater, especially if it's an older, heavily eroded, hard to, hard to see crater. Um, and so looking at the earth and saying, oh, um, this is where the craters are, it's not like there's some sort of giant magnet here uh, in the Midwest United States that's attracting asteroids to, to hit Illinois and make a lot of craters. It's just geologically, there's not much going on in Illinois. A lot of people live there. And you know, it's, it's easier to notice than the craters there, and they tend to last longer. Um, maybe I'll just sort of leave it at that. And so this is, this is not the impact history of the Earth by far. All of our craters then tend to be younger because they're destroyed very, very quickly here on the surface of the Earth. Unless it's a particularly large crater, maybe some of those can survive a little bit. Um, what's interesting, though, is if you do a little bit of geology then and you dig down into the Earth, remember the further down you dig, you're also then basically going back into the past. This idea of over time, these layers building up then on the Earth's surface and going down uh, backwards in time, digging down further and further and further. And you can run into a, a, a sort of line here, uh, digging down then, um, that's referred to then as the KT boundary. And, and at this depth here, um, you're talking typically uh, an age of about 65 uh, uh, million years. And this is the end, this is sort of the separation then, um, gosh, what do we want to say about it? The, the, the sort of the, the separation then with the creaceous period. 65 million years ago is an important time because that's when, um, basically that's when the dinosaurs died off. And so you can dig down in the earth and you can find this layer then um, whose, whose age corresponds to you know, basically when the, the dinosaurs died off about, about 65 million years ago. And I should point out how far, how deep this is buried depends on where you're looking. There are places on the earth then um, where it's been totally eroded away and, and it's basically um, almost at, almost like, uh, almost sort of at, down a little bit then. I don't know what you want to say. Um, uh, some places then it's hundreds of feet below the surface. Some places then it's actually, uh, actually quite, uh, close to the surface, where it's been sort of totally eroded away. And it's, um, so the KT bound, I'm, I'm rambling at this point because um, what gets interesting then is if you look at the composition of the KT boundary, and here we are then basically going deeper and deeper into the earth. Here's the, here's the KT boundary then, the, the sort of the boundary then between the creaceous and the, the tertiary uh, periods. And looking then at the iridium abundance that you find in, in the material. And so basically, um, hardly any, hardly any iridium, hardly any iridium. And you hit the KT boundary and there's this huge spike in the iridium then that you find in this clay. This is in parts per billion. There's a huge spike in iridium then and it sort of drops off and then it sort of, sort of goes back to normal. But there's this period here. At, and this is the, the age you're talking about going into the past, 53.5 million years ago, 65 million years ago, 70 million years ago. Um, and this, this is the depth then. Oh, no, that's not the depth. Yeah, no, never mind. That's, that's actually the height. We're not going to go there. Um, there. There's a huge spike in the iridium abundance then in, in the KT boundary. And that gets... Um, that gets it's sort of weird then because iridium then easily dissolves then in molten molten rock and so looking then at the composition of the earth's crust in the differentiation process iridium then should have just been basically uh dissolved in the, in the molten rock basically sank to the center of the earth if you walk around on the surface of the earth then there's not much iridium and so iridium then is actually really really rare in earth rocks but if you think about then asteroids and chunks of asteroids, this unprocessed material still left over from the formation of the solar system, and most of it, with the exception of like the M-class asteroids, stuff like that, for the most part, though, it's undifferentiated, unheated material. Uh, there's lots of iridium then in, in asteroids and, and lots of iridium then in typical meteorites, unless you're talking about a, 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 you know, an iron meteorite, something like that. Well, actually, iron will have a lot of uh, a lot of iridium. Unless you're talking about an achondrite. How about that? Uh, for the most part, then, you tend to find a lot of iridium, then, um, in meteors. And so the idea of sort of driving this, then, is, oh, all of a sudden, there's a huge 
deposit of iridium then here on the surface of the earth. It gets people thinking about this idea of there having been then some sort of giant asteroid, some sort of giant impact then about 65 million years ago that coincides then with basically all the, the extinction of the dinosaurs. And there, there are other sort of sorts of examples as well then, like you find sort of shocked quartz then also at this depth. And that shocked quartz then is the result of some sort of, you know, shock. It's uh, the result then of some sort of shock process then shocks the quartz. That quartz then gets blown up into the atmosphere and distributed then all over the earth. And, and the only trouble though, what, what bothered people about this is there were really you know, if you look, there's no large crater on the Earth that corresponds to a, 65 million years ago, that corresponds to an age of 65 million years. And the argument was always, well, that crater then, I'm um, sure that happened, but that crater has long since been eroded or destroyed, or maybe this thing landed in the ocean. Um, don't know. Not sure. And it, it wasn't then um, until the 1970s um, that uh, uh, people were looking for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And as part of doing, you know, searching for oil, you do a, a lot of extensive sort of geological mapping, looking at what's going on then um, with the geology of certain areas. And, and it turns out then they, they actually found just off the Yucatan Peninsula then actually found a crater, a, a, a really large crater then just off the Yucatan Peninsula. And so here it is then, um, just outside the town of Chiliuxa. And that's sort of the name of this, this crater. And yeah, the crater's been buried. The crater then has been covered up. It's been eroded and covered up then um, with time. But it's about 110 miles in diameter then. And if you, if you start, stop and think about, well, okay, I've got a crater, 110 miles in diameter then. How big does a typical object then striking the Earth have to be to leave a crater this large behind? And it's something about 10 kilometers across, or about an, uh, an asteroid then, or a chunk of rock, bit of debris then from space, about six kilometers across then, uh, sorry, six miles across, 10 kilometers uh, uh, striking the Earth then. And it would have struck with enough energy, clearing out a, you know, a crater that large, striking with that much energy, would have kicked an immense amount of debris up into the atmosphere, a lot of dust. And you kick all this dust up into the atmosphere and you go, wait a minute though, um, this dust is gonna tend to reflect sunlight back into space. It's not gonna strike the ground. And so um, it's not gonna strike the ground. The temperatures here on the ground then without the, the heat from the sun then are gonna drop. And something like this then actually causing sort of a mini ice age the, the, as this dust gets kicked up into the atmosphere. And this mini ice age then is going to last for years until this dust settles back out of the atmosphere and creates the KT boundary, by the way. All this dust is settling back to the surface and then it gets covered up. But you look at that, that boundary today then and that's the dust from the impact. And you go, oh, look at all the iridium. Look at all the shocked quartz and all this other evidence then for a big impact. And if you date the age of this crater then, if you look at sort of the geological processes and work it backwards, well, if this is what we see today, you know, how long did it take to bury this crater? When did this crater actually happen? When was it made? It's about 65 million years ago. And so this is the impact then that basically uh, basically cause the extinction of the dinosaurs or, or basically about 30% of the species or more here on the surface of the earth. Because what happens is you get the temperatures drop, you get that sort of mini ice age from the dust in the atmosphere, the temperatures drop, the plant life starts to have trouble surviving, you lose a lot of plants, oh wait a minute then, you're starting to, you're basically one of the, the bases of the food chain all of a sudden, you know, just get a food pyramid, there we go. The, the base of the food pyramid gets knocked out and all of a sudden a lot of species have trouble then um, surviving. And, and that's the idea behind this. And, and so this is the, the idea with the dinosaurs and it's the, the result of, of, of an impact. And, and again, it's not the impact itself that killed the dinosaurs. Yes, anybody hanging around here um, on the earth then when this thing hit, yeah, it would have been a really bad day for them. But you know, it's, uh, species, things on the other side of the earth, then they're not going to be affected by this. There's not going to be any sort of shock wave or fire or anything like that that's going to kill them. What kills them then is the aftermath and, and all the dust being kicked up into the atmosphere. And looking then at sort of the, the history of species here on the earth, this is something you'll see in lab also. Um, what, we're, what we're looking here on the bottom then is basically 
looking back in time and millions of years ago. And so this is today and looking back in time, 50 million, 100 million, 150 million years. And what's plotted on the, the sort of y-axis here then is at that period, what percentage of the species um, actually went extinct at, at that time. And you can look then, it's 65 million years ago that there's a huge extinction peak right here, where about 30% of the species then uh, all of a sudden disappeared. And there's sort of a, a, a sort of natural sort of selection effect evolution going on. This species are always sort of, uh, you know, I don't want to say dying, but we, you know, you're you're always losing some species. But then there are these these mass extinction event, events like right here at about 260 million years ago, um, 50 percent of the species then uh, became extinct at that point. And, and thinking about, gosh. Um, this is not unusual, this, this sort of mass die-off when we lost the dinosaurs. This has happened here, here, big time here, maybe here, here, here. Um, uh, so these extinction events then are actually not that uncommon. And thinking about, well, why do we have a Why are there certain periods of time in the history of the Earth where all of a sudden a, a significant number of the species suddenly became extinct? And of course, one of the ideas behind this is, yeah, you can have then these impacts on the earth. This is an artist's sort of uh, uh, picture of this. And it's a little extreme. Um, no, <laughs> uh, we're not talking anything like that, but I like that then just because it's like, oh, um, but, but, but you could have then these impacts with, with debris from the solar system a few miles across, six miles across for the dinosaurs, maybe 10 miles across it, these objects hitting the earth and basically changing the climate on the earth with all this dust kicked up into the atmosphere. And as a result of that, then a whole bunch of species are basically dying off before they have a chance to adapt. And, and that this has happened in the past. We're, all, we're very confident this happened with the dinosaurs. But looking back at those other extinction events and thinking about then maybe this is the origin of those extinction events as well. The tricky part then is associating that with a crater, finding some evidence of an impact. And what makes that really, really hard then is, our, is again, the dynamic crust of the earth. These geological processes that are constantly creating and destroying new crust, uh, these erosion processes, you know, the wind and, and tearing them down and, and the ice sheets burying them, glaciers coming in and smoothing everything out. Um, all of these processes then all work to destroy craters. And so maybe you have an extinction event that happened 255 million years ago, and maybe it was the result of an impact, but that crater then long gone. And so, so it gets tricky then actually identifying the extinction events and with impacts. And you can have other, you can have other sources then of, of changes in the climate then that could also be responsible. Slight change in the, the, the our, our orbit um, can change the climate. Um, you could also have periods then of heavy volcanism where the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases. Again, that can also result in these extinction events. So it's a complicated problem. But, but we know that it has happened. And especially, you know, again, in the case of the dinosaurs. And that's why if you go back to what we saw yesterday with looking then at people trying to figure out where are the asteroids in our solar system and trying to, you know, find them and get their orbits. And the hope then is that we will be able to find one. If, if one of these impactors then is heading for the Earth in the future, um, we should be able to find them. Uh, we hope then we, we should be able to uh, you know, find them before they hit us. And that'll be a real turning point then, uh, where you sort of start controlling then your own destiny, um, at least in terms of extinction events like this. Um, all right, well, that's a weird thing to end a class on then, this idea of giant impacts wiping out Earth, you know, significant swaths of life on Earth. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Um, I, I hope you had some fun this semester, or as I'd say this, this term then. Um, I know this was, again, I know this was a lot to go through. Um, I know that there was a lot of material presented very, very quickly. Um, but, um, and so I, I hope you did have some fun, and I hope it, at least it was uh, all a little bit interesting. And again, um, I've got office hours. I'll also then have office hours tonight uh, from 8 to 10, and also for tomorrow then for the exam, be around from, from 10 to 2 
um, if you want to jump on Zoom if you have some questions. And just don't forget then, everything has to be finished then um, by one minute to midnight on Friday. And uh, again, you know, if you have any questions, uh, come see me or send me an email, something like that. And uh, until maybe someday I see you in person, um, take care.